Welcome back after the summer recess. We launch this second series of teachings with a study of Hebrews warnings. Let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we present ourselves before you to receive truth and to understand uh, more about you and uh, your word to us. We know that you love us and you want the very best for us. So we want to learn as much as possible so we can walk in a way that pleases you in our lives. Bless us, Lord, this evening, the, the ears that hear the message and uh, also the lips that want to speak forth the truth of God's word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In this first session this evening, I want to introduce this whole subject to you about God warning us and trying to protect us from harm. In the, in the second, after the break, we'll look at the first of five warnings that Hebrews uh, lay out before us. Th this first warning is the warning not to, uh, to stray from God, to drift away, but to pay attention. The introduction then. As Christians, we must keep moving forward. We really only have two options. We're either going to go forward in the things of God or we're going to start slipping back. There's no real neutral place. It's not as though uh, some years ago or decades ago you, you got saved and you're just now waiting, as it were, in between salvation and either you leaving or Jesus Christ returning. That's not a good way to think about our Christian life at all. We shouldn't really talk about being saved. Yes, we are saved, but the sort of language just doesn't help us. It suggests that there's something of a static state. I'm saved and that's it, I just stay in this place. Salvation is really a process. It's a, a growth, it's a, it's a development. There are three ways in which we can look at salvation. We could say that we were saved on a particular day in our life, we gave our lives to Jesus Christ. We could say that what is happening to us now, we are being changed, we are being saved. We could say we're being saved from ourselves. And we know that one day when Jesus returns, then we will be eternally saved. The Bible uses uh, three other words uh, in place of saved. It says, when we first came to Christ, we were justified, just as if we'd never sinned. It's we're cleansed, we're acceptable to him. This second process that we go through through life, which is the longest process, of course, is the work of sanctification, being cleaned. The, the way that we used to think and act is slowly coming out of our lives and we're embracing a new sort of life, life in the kingdom of God. And then this final stage of salvation, when we are actually with him and we know that all that former life has gone now and we have a new future with him, we call that being glorified. Paul puts it like this in Acts 17, 28. It says, for in him we live and move and have our being. It's as though we grow up every day. We're living in him. He's in us, we're in him, and the whole thing is active and growing and alive. The author of Proverbs, he says something similar. He says in Proverbs 4 and 18, it says, the path of the righteous, those who have been made righteous through Christ, is like the first gleam of dawn shining ever brighter till the full light of day. It's as though we're on a path, we're on a journey, and as the sun starts to rise and come higher in the sky, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter until we reach that point where uh, we're fully developed, as it were, in him. Righteousness, then, is not a state that we dwell in, it's a path that we journey through life. The light on the path gets brighter. Every day, as it were, we reach further into God. We reach our goal. Every day, we could say we crave more light, 
more revelation of God so we understand more. It's a development thing. True biblical faith is not a faith that simply keeps us as Christians. It's one that very gently pushes us forward. As I said, if we're not moving forward in faith, we will be slipping back. Constantly, we must be on our guard because although the Holy Spirit desires to move us forward into God, we know that there is a, a living, real enemy who's seeking to divert us onto the wrong path, take us off the path completely. He wants to foil what God is trying to do in our lives in this saving process. It says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3, this is Paul speaking, he says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. In this life of pure devotion to Christ, growing up in Christ, journeying with him, the enemy has come to deceive us, as he did, he said, with Eve, to, to turn us away from the path. Hebrews 10, 38 and 39 says this, But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I'll not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Satan is trying to cause us to shrink back from this growing up in him, from this work of salvation in our lives. He wants to destroy, as it were, our testimony. He wants to rob us of life in the kingdom, he doesn't want us living in the kingdom of God. He would rather we lived in the kingdom of this world with all its pressures and difficulties. And so he's trying to pull us from one kingdom into another. And we know that the distance we make in this world will have an effect on our eternal life. And he wants to rob us of that as well. We can then, it says in this scripture, be righteous ones who live by faith, but then we draw back. But my righteous ones will live by faith. And if he shrinks back. So it's possible to be a righteous one, to have received Christ, to have started on this journey. But because of things in our life, we cause to shrink back, to draw ourselves away. You see... What we're looking at in this study, this whole series of studies, is the warnings that God has for us. It says here, if we live like this, we draw back, we shrink back, God is not pleased with us. His love for us is never in question, but is not pleased with us. We love our children, don't we? Uh, we wouldn't have anyone say anything uh, against them for one minute we would do everything we would give our lives for them but there are times in our lives when our children don't bring us pleasure so that has nothing to do with the love that God has for us through the book of Hebrews we will discover there are five warnings they reveal Satan's schemes to outwit us Paul says we shouldn't be ignorant of Satan's schemes to, to defeat us, to, to, to draw us away from him. We want to keep moving forward in the things of God. Before we uh, examine these, I want to uh, just ask a, a question generally of you because it will help in the whole understanding of this subject or it make you think one way or another. So the, the question is, is it possible for a Christian, once saved, once experiencing the life of the Spirit within, is it possible for that person to lose their salvation? To actually completely stop believing in Christ? To, to, to just abandon the whole faith altogether? Or is that an impossibility? Once saved, we are always saved. 
In our Christian life, we have to be very careful that we, we keep away from the extremes. Some people live their lives uh, thinking, oh, I'm saved and uh, that's it now. I can just live and do whatever I like and it doesn't really matter because I won't lose my salvation. That's an extreme. That's a dangerous place to live. Other people go to the other end and they say, well, uh, God wants me to be pure and perfect and so whenever I do anything wrong, I'm just frightened that God will somehow judge me harshly in the whole business, ending up living very legalistic sort of lives. I'd ask the question, are you saved? It's important we know that we are saved, born again of the Spirit of God. Uh, I just give you five questions that would assure you of your own salvation. There should be an affirmative answer to at least uh, five of these, if not six. Here's the first question. Can I honestly confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord? We want him to save us and to be our saviour, but do we make him the Lord of our life? It's as though you can't have him as your saviour without having him as your Lord. As your Lord, he dictates the sort of life you live. You listen to him, you watch what he did and you follow him because he is your Lord. Can you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord? Do I always want to obey Christ even though sometimes I fail? Well, if you just upset with yourself a little bit, if you've done it wrong, that's a good sign because if we could choose, we would never do anything wrong. We would walk in the righteousness of Christ. The third is, am I disappointed with myself when I sin? Am I a little bit frustrated? The fourth one, do I keep myself from the devil? Am I careful about where I go, the people I mix with and the activities I involve myself in? Do I think through carefully? Is this pleasing to God, these things I'm doing and who I'm with and, and what I'm doing? The fifth is, do I love other Christians even though I find them really difficult at times? I just give them, or I'm able to find more grace to, to live with them and to understand them and to just persevere. The sixth one, which is somewhat optional but it's very reassuring, is have I received the Holy Spirit in his fullness and speak in tongues. Uh, we can be thoroughly born again without speaking in tongues. It's just speaking in tongues is a seal. It's an uh, assurance that uh, something supernatural and spiritual has happened within us. Three verses that assure us of our salvation. Five questions and now three verses. The first is that we are chosen by God. It says in Ephesians 1 and verse 4, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Really? Before I ever existed, God knew that I would come into the world and he chose me whether I would be saved or not. Is that what it's saying? I don't read it like that. What I believe it's saying, of course, this is when I say I believe that you're at liberty to think differently and we won't fall out about that. Because God lives outside of time, he can look into time and he sees eternity as one event in front of him. So before, before the creation of the world, as it were, God could look through the, uh, the corridor of time, as it were, and see me, see me being born, see me being presented with the gospel of Christ, see me responding positively and receiving Christ as my saviour. Because I chose, and I was at liberty to choose or to reject the saviour, because I chose him, God chose me. God said, this is it then, this is set. He has chosen and I have chosen him. So he's chosen us. The second is our salvation is not based on works, but it's his grace. It says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. 
the gift. Some would say, well, the gift that he gives us is the gift of having faith to get saved. Mm. Again, I don't, wouldn't agree with that. I think the gift that he offers to us is the gift of his mercy. In his graciousness, he offers us mercy. He doesn't have to. We didn't earn it or deserve it. God was just gracious to us. So it's the free gift of his grace of mercy to us. And we have responded with the faith that we have in receiving that mercy. The third verse to assure us of our salvation is found in John 6 and 39. It says there that Christ has the power to keep us. Having given our lives to Christ, he won't lose us. He, he holds on to us. It says this, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of them that he has given me, but I'll raise them up at the last day. Christ has the ability and he will save and keep all of those who have put their faith and trust in him. What are the five warnings then that uh, are laid out for us in the book of Hebrews? I'll give you the references to them and a general description of what they are and a verse that relates to it. The first warning we have is to be careful that we don't drift away. Drift away from Christ, where Christ isn't really that important to us. He's important on the day that we get saved. We think this is wonderful what Christ has done, but unless we maintain and build on that relationship, there's a danger that we become cold in the relationship and we drift away from him. Hebrews 2, 1 to 4, there's a verse that says, we must pay more careful attention Therefore, to what we have heard, so that we don't drift away. That's the first warning. The second is found in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 to chapter 4, verse 13. He warns us about doubting God's word. We read his word, we believe that it's true, but we don't exercise faith in it. So do we really believe it? We doubt his word. It says this in one of, those, uh, one of the verses from that passage. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. And that hardening one's heart is not to believe or put faith in what God has said. The third warning is in Hebrews. Uh, you have to read between uh, chapter 5, 11 to chapter 6 and 20. It, it talks about us being... Uh, dull, as it were, towards God, slow to learn, as he puts it. I'll read one of the verses from that text. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because he says you are slow to learn. Now, with scriptural things and spiritual things, it's not a question of intellect. Now, I'm, there's nothing wrong in having a good intellect. Uh, it's good to be smart. It's good to be quick on the uptake. But the things of the Spirit of God are spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit, even if we couldn't read or write, could still reveal the truth of God to our hearts, directly to our hearts. And maybe our minds then would start to catch up with what we understand and know and believe. So, dullness towards his word, uh, there is a danger in that. The fourth warning, Hebrews 10, 26 to 29, it talks about despising God's word. This is a really uh, serious warning. It says this, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. It's one thing to slip, to make a mistake. It's quite another thing to deliberately keep on sinning when we know what the truth is. That's when we harbour sin in our hearts and uh, that's a much more serious place that we need to deal with. The fifth warning in Hebrews is taken from chapter 12 from verses 14 to 29. It talks about defying the word. He says, see to it that you do not refuse him who spoke. When God speaks, respond. Listen to what he's saying 
and act on it. What then do these five warnings teach us? We'll look at each one individually over the weeks, uh, but we're just doing an introduction now. So this is a general. All these warnings that we read about are for believers. The whole book is, is the believer's book. It's, it's a covenant uh, agreement between believers and God himself. So the warnings are not for non-believers. These warnings are for us. The warning is not to drift away from God, not to ignore him, not to, not to listen to him, because if we do, this second stage of salvation doesn't happen in our lives. We are saved. We've put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You might know a day, a time and an hour when you did it. You might have prayed or simply received it, realised that you were born again of the Spirit. We know that one day when Jesus comes, we will be saved eternally with him. But in the middle is this middle part, this middle part of salvation, which is the sanctifying of our lives. If we're not focusing on God and his word, this whole process of salvation, this cleansing up of our lives, it doesn't take place. It doesn't happen. It's as though we're not living in the kingdom. We don't experience kingdom life because we don't want to. We don't allow that sort of salvation to take place in our lives. The second point that we can see from these warnings is that God is a, a caring father who wants the very best for us. <laughs> the Bible is described as a pastoral book. Uh, I'm not surprised. All the great characters of the Old Testament, there were shepherds, wasn't it? Abraham was a shepherd, Jacob, David, Moses. All these, they were, they were shepherds. That was their occupation. And so the whole imagery of salvation and God and is like he is a, a, a shepherd. In the New Testament, we say that the Lord is our, our good shepherd. He is the shepherd of the sheep. We're like sheep and we follow the shepherd. It's a pastoral book, but it's also a parental book. Remember when they said, uh, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he said, our Father, which art in heaven. So this book is, is not only a pastoral book, but it's a, a parenting book as well. Parents love their children. Good parents love and encourage their children. They want the very best for them. They nurture them. They help them to grow up the best way possible. But there are times when they have to warn their children. It would be foolish to think they just encouraged and loved without warning. But warning is part of love as well. Both are needed at different times. We need to be loved and encouraged and we need to be loved and warned. We need, we need the affirmation and we need the warning. When it comes to scriptural things, a warning could be, if you do not persevere, you will lose out. That's a warning. You persevere in the things of God, otherwise you'll miss out on kingdom blessing. The promise is Christ gives you the power to persevere to press on. You're not on your own. He will help you to do that. The Father also constantly encourages us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, we worship God the Father, but in the Godhead, his, his Son and the Holy Spirit, and our relationship is also with the Son. He wants us to love and to work with and to be one with his son. The warnings of scripture are those who make little of Christ, make little of the relationship, not particularly interested in developing that relationship with Christ. The promises, on the other hand, are for those who make much of Christ. So we need the warnings if we're making little of him, we thank God for the promises when we're making much of him. In both instances, warnings or promises, the idea is that Christ is exalted. All power, all authority was given to him. He is the king of the whole 
universe. The practical lessons of these warnings is to make much of Christ. Ignoring Christ is the singular work of the Christian falling away. See, we might not think we're falling away. We might think we're saved, we're in this static condition, we don't give Christ too much thought or attention, we might sing a song to him, we might hear a sermon about him when we go to church, but he's not central in our thought. Can I suggest, if that's your life's experience, you are drifting, you're not in a static place. That static place doesn't exist. You're either moving forward with Christ or you're falling away. Falling away from Christ in this world will affect our relationship with him in the next. Well, of course, we're here to develop an ongoing and building a relationship with him. God will discipline us. He'll discipline us because he loves us. God knows that our eternal destiny depends upon our obedience to his word. He, his love is so great towards us that he will not cease in disciplining us. Let me read those couple of verses. They're a bit chilling, really. They're found in Hebrews 12, uh, 4 to 6. It says, In your struggle against sin, so God knows that we're struggling, there are sins that are trying to draw us off the path or, uh, you know, deceive us or trick us. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Well, we know that some have in the past, and he's assuming that the vast majority reading this haven't. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as sons. So if you claim sonship of God, a brotherhood with Christ, the Lord will discipline you because he loves you and he cares for you. It might not cost us our lives, uh, but he will discipline us in a very serious way. There are exceptions to where God has taken people out of the scene, as it were, because of the potential damage as Christians that they were, they were causing to other brothers and sisters in the church. I suppose as, uh, as, a, as an example of this, uh, I know it's um, nothing in relationship to, to God, me moving powerfully in my life, but if we take the situation with a football match, if a player causes a foul, uh, the, the, the trainer, the manager, he knows if he causes another foul where he gets two yellow cards, he'll be drawn off the field. And so that team, his team, would be 10 versus 11. Probably that would be the end of the game for them. They would lose the game. So what he does in his wisdom, he draw, if he sees he's not calming down, he might draw that person off the field and replace him with another. Why? Because he wants to protect him. He also wants to protect his team and the lead that they have, the victory that's possible. If we do damage to the church, God's at full liberty to remove us. I don't believe for one minute we lose our salvation, but he could choose to do that. I think the story of Ananias and Sapphira is, is a clear example of this. The, the church is a fledgling church. It's starting to develop and grow, and uh, many are being added to the church, and we see this couple, I presume that they are somewhat mature Christians, and um, they want some notoriety. They want to be looked upon as special, as it were. So what they've done, they've taken a, a, 
a plot of land that they have, they've sold it, and they've told everyone, including the leaders of the church at that time, that uh, they'd sold everything and they were, they were giving everything they had to the church. Peter knows this isn't true. The Holy Spirit reveals to him. They're seeking to deceive the Holy Spirit, to deceive the church. Uh, and so God says, I can't have this in my church. It's too young at this stage. They have too much influence, perhaps, on other people. Let me read the account to you. It says in Acts 5, 3 and 5. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart, that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? He goes on to say in that passage, the land was yours, the money was yours, you could do with what you wanted, you could have given some and held. Why did you try and deceive the church? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And as we read on, we find that his wife then appeared and he challenged her with the same thing, and she too died. Like I said, God can take his, um, I don't know, his dealing with us to, to the ultimate, as far as we're concerned. The ultimate, of course, is that they were uh, still born again and uh, they probably will be in eternity. The, the last point I want to make here is that God our Father is, is patient and long-suffering even in the warnings, as we read them, he, he starts simply with a warning of careful you don't drift away and then careful you don't disbelieve and then it gets more and more serious as we read through the book of Hebrews. Again, it's a bit like a parent. The child is messing and causing a nuisance of himself. So the parent says, now you must stop this. Uh, the child takes little notice and continues, so the warning gets more severe until eventually action has to be taken. The parent can't keep on saying forever, I'm not going to do anything. The parent has to do something, otherwise his authority is totally undermined. And so action is taken. Always better to respond at the first warning than the last. And so also in the things of God. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of the introduction. We're going to have a little break now, and after the break, we'll look at the first warning, the warning to pay attention. Thank you. The first then of these five warnings we're examining over the next couple of studies. The warning to pay attention. I'll read to you first the passage of scripture in Hebrews so we all uh, have heard it together and then we'll uh, examine it uh, carefully. Hebrews 2 then verses 1 to 4. We must pay careful attention therefore to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders and various miracles, the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. We must pay more 
careful attention, therefore. We must pay attention. We must all pay attention. Both teacher and pupil alike, we pay attention. There is a danger that as we uh, get older in the Christian faith, we can be a little bit um, complacent. Oh, yes, I know all that. Um, yeah, I understand all that. And it, it's, it's not a good place to be. All of us. Remember what Paul said, that if he had uh, spent his life preaching and explaining everything and then telling everyone about everything, that he himself was lost because he wasn't adhering to the very words that were coming from his mouth. So we must all pay attention. God spoke to us in former times through prophets, through angels. This time, Christ has spoken to us. He sent his only son. It says in Hebrews 1 and verse 2, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Maybe one thing to ignore a prophet, that was never a wise thing. Uh, maybe one thing to ignore an angel, that wasn't wise. But to ignore his son, Christ himself and the things that he said. It goes on to say, we must pay careful attention. Care must be there in the things that we're listening to. The longer, I said, we've been a Christian, the more complacent we can become. We're not so careful about our Christian life. It's all established. Uh, some have got to a stage of believing and they don't want to believe anymore. They don't want to understand anymore. This is sufficient for them. We've settled. A lot have settled for what they know and understand and they're not looking to increase on their knowledge. Remember what I said in the previous lecture. I said, listen, there's no, there's no standing still. And if you're not moving forward in the things of God, if you're not learning more, if you're not moving into a deeper relationship, you are slipping back. You're falling away. We will lose ground that we once won. In my ministry, I, uh, at the start of my ministry, I, I was pastoring uh, quite a lively charismatic church. I found myself teaching uh, quite a lot and traveling and teaching as well. And then my, my ministry changed and I found myself uh, working with uh, quite a number of homeless people and um, we had a church for them. Uh, it wasn't quite the same. They struggled and so you couldn't uh, preach sermons in the same way that you would have uh, as I did formerly. And so uh, it was more about stories and activities rather than the Word of God, uh, uh, you know, teaching as we would understand it. I found that over a few years, the knowledge that I had, it sort of left me. It's as though if you don't keep going forward, keep putting into practice the things that you've learned, you lose it. Well, that's true in everything of life. You could study a whole course on something, start work in that area, then if you move job and you never did that again, it wouldn't take long before you forgot everything you ever learned. We have to keep practicing and moving on in this. We have to be careful. The danger is not that we reject the Word of God, but we end up neglecting His Word. When we neglect the exhortation of what God's Word tells us to do, we start to drift in our Christian life. <laughs> the nature of drifting in itself is that we don't realise we've moved. We think we're all right. But, of course, you know, to go on a lilo and, and lay on the sea and... and, and uh, under the sunshine there, just to close your eyes for a minute, and then when you look around, um, the shoreline has, has moved by, it could be several hundreds of yards, so we'd have to take some action. We didn't appreciate that we were drifting. In the Old Testament, we know that when people drifted from God, God would, uh, he would chasten them. 
uh, a word we don't use much today, he would subdue them, he would restrain them, he would discipline or even to some extent he would punish them when they violated the message that was spoken to them by prophets or, or angels, he would take action against them. But what about the message that Christ has given us? Surely he would take action if we violated or just ignored what he was saying, of course. I want to remind you of a situation with the children of Israel. When the children of Israel came out of captivity in Egypt, God brought them uh, through a desert situation to Sinai. From Sinai they moved up to where God was going to take them into the Promised Land. It took them a couple of years from when they left Egypt to entry into the Promised Land. We know that before they went in, they sent a number of spies in, a representative from each tribe. Mm. One scripture indicates that God told them to do that. Another, it doesn't say anything at all. So it doesn't matter. God had said, you will go in. This is the plan to take you in. It was a good idea to send spies in to see what the land was like. Uh, they brought back a, a mixed report. Uh, they said, oh, it, oh, it's fantastic. So fertile. Uh, it'd be easy farm in this land and it's wonderful. B but they said there's terrible cities and giants and uh, a lot of armies that would have to defeat. They were afraid to go in. Even though God had told them to go in, he didn't send spies in so they would come back and then make their opinion. Uh, no, no, God had, had said what they should do. Then after a while, when they said first said no, and then they said, oh, we changed our mind, we'll go in now, they weren't allowed to. Listen what it says. But Moses said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed, he says. The plan for you now to go in when you said you would and then you wouldn't, do not go up because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. For the Amalekites, the Canaanites, they will face you there. Because you have turned away from the Lord, he will not be with you and you will fall by the sword. See, they were chastened for not being obedient and simply trusting God and moving forward. God said, then you won't go in. And so they experienced a wilderness experience. Uh, the wilderness wasn't designed for them. The promised land was designed for them. But because of their refusal to listen and to obey God, they found themselves in this wilderness experience, a place where there was no purpose to their life, no direction. Their life for the next 38 years became quite meaningless. And all those over the age of 20 they all died in the wilderness over the next few years by refusing to do what God had said and being obedient to his word, they exposed themselves to Satan's attack on their lives. Did God ever stop loving them? No, he loved them, but it says he was angry with them. As you see, they didn't bring him pleasure. They were, they were out of sorts with God. In verse 2, it uses two words there. It speaks about a violation and a disobedience. To knowingly break God's word is a violation. That's a very strong word. To knowingly ignore God's word is a disobedience. Now, they're both wrong and God will take action against both. We have very little excuse today of saying we don't know what God requires of us. We have his word. We live in a country where we can go uh, for as little as five pounds and buy a modern version of, of God's word. We can read it to our heart's content. Uh, the, the literacy rates in this country are very high. And even if we couldn't read well, we can just put it on our mobile phones and listen to the word of God being read to us. We have no reason for saying, I didn't know. 
God confirms or testifies to his words, it says, with signs and wonders. When God asks us to do something, something either written in his word or we hear someone speaking and we feel that God is impressing us to do something, if we respond and do it, we can expect to see the miraculous in our lives. If we refuse to do it, we will not enjoy that. Now, I think we've cheated ourselves out of the miraculous because we talk about things being the providence of God. I understand, it's like circumstances around us seem to change and move and they fall into place for us and we say that's providential. Mm, I think it's more like miraculous. And so God is quite prepared to move things for us if we obey him, listen to him, uh, don't neglect what he's saying, seek to put it into practice, we'll know the blessing of God in our lives. What is it we have danger of drifting away from? In this drifting, in this not paying attention to his word. The message that was first preached to these Hebrew people, it talks about a great salvation. We just go back to that passage again and I'll, uh, I'll read it to you. For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation here's a question for you is the salvation you've got great is it great or is it just well i've got salvation i believe we're not sure whether uh, the letter was written to the first or second generations of christians if it was to the first generations of Christians, and there's indication later in, later in the letter to believe it was, they had experienced a great salvation. Wonderful. I mean, it was just glorious. But if this was the second generation, they had lost something of its greatness. Is it possible that in the West today, this great salvation that the Bible talks about has been watered down? so that people coming to Christ today don't appreciate the greatness of it. Much of it has been diluted, as it were. It lacks the power that it should have. We've heard about how to get saved, how to escape hell, how to get to heaven, and little more. We've little appetite for great salvation. We settle for salvation and not the life of Christ. We look at Christ and think, he is my saviour, but I'm, I'm not really expected to live like him. To live like him is the great salvation. Simply to be saved is, is wonderful, but it's not the great salvation they're talking about here. This great salvation would claim our entire devotion. Only an insight into its abundant glory and surpassing greatness will compel us, men and women, to willingly and joyfully give up everything so we acquire this great salvation. Remember those parables about the man who finds a treasure in the field and another who discovers the pearl of great price. Both of them, similar parables. They're prepared to sell everything they have that they might possess these treasures. You see, is salvation that great that you would surrender everything to lay hold of it? This great salvation is not a small thing. It comes from the triune God. It talks about 
as I quote from the, the passage we read, which were first announced, this salvation was first announced by the Lord. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who came announcing salvation to us. It goes on to say, God, that's God the Father, also testifies to it by signs and wonders and various miracles. He testifies, the power of God testifies to what Christ has said. And then he brings in the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. God came to us. He came to us through Christ. He came through the manifestation of the gifts. He came and sent the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us. To, to neglect God's word is nothing less than to despise God himself. We neglect God's word at our peril as believers. What should we do then? Well, I think we should be hungry to discover more truth that liberates us, that gives us a better understanding of who God is and his love for us. We must study. The Word of God says study to become experts in 2 Timothy 2.15. So we correctly handle the word of truth. It's not good enough to say, well, I'm saved and that's it. No, no, if you just act like that, you will drift away. And we must, as 1 Peter uh, 3 and 15 tells us, we must always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us the reason for the hope that we have. Your hope is in that Christ will return, that you will live with God forever. If I ask you questions about that, do you have the answers ready to give me? It says in uh, Hebrews 5 that each one of us should be teachers. I don't think that means stand uh, on a pulpit or behind a lectern and teach in that same way. But if anyone asks us about a certain doctrine or a truth in the Bible, could we sit down and explain to them? He lists them there, doesn't he? He talks about repentance and faith and the baptisms and uh, the judgment and the resurrection. If someone said, explain to me about the resurrection, could you do that? Explain to me about the judgments, could you do that? See, we have a responsibility to learn and to study and to move on, otherwise we'll drift away. The church in the West today has material, more teaching material than any previous generation. People have, uh, maybe a, a person who is studying the things of God could have anything from five to 10 to 20 different Bibles in his bookcase. Uh, like I said, they're, they're cheap, they're easily accessible, tapes and teachings and so much. But sadly, no generation has been more materialistic than the generation we live in today. And no generation has been under such pressure as they are today. And with the advance in technology, that doesn't ease the pressure from us, it increases the pressure. So we can do more, we can cram more into our lives. We must redeem the time. We must organize the priorities in our life if we are to heed the warnings that we're going to discover in the book of Hebrews. Thank you. God bless you.